It is generally accepted that the incidence of end-stage renal failure in the United Kingdom for those under the age of 60 is 40 per million per year. It has been estimated that in 1977, if you took eight of those people in renal failure, then the facilities available would have allowed three to receive treatment. The remaining five will have died. Dialysis has been the main life-saving treatment for renal failure. Improvements in design are constantly being made. However, it still involves dependence on a machine. And in many cases, the success will, to a large degree, depend on acceptance of this by the patient. Well, we've coped pretty well for ten and a half years. I mean, the main essential for home dialysis is a, a stable family background. If you've got that, then, then you're away. And the attitude of mind helps a lot. I think you remember that this is what keeps you alive. Without it, you'd be dead. Well, you don't complain too much about it. It's a tedious process, but um, you learn to accept it. It's part of the family. Three times a week. It restricts your activities a bit, but um, they say the constant reminder is there. It keeps you earning money to support your family. The restrictions are that your social life, obviously, yes. is limited. And yes. Bart? Yes, that's what's going to Why was Percy calling me just now? What's oh, oh. <laughs> this man has been kept alive for ten years by dialysis. He's also kept actively working on his local newspaper, but it has demanded adjustments to his life at home. In the early days, when you're learning, you tend to miss the vein, which is not necessarily painful, but a bit um, traumatic till you learn to hit the vein first time, which is, I can do now, say, 49 times out of 50. This competence was learned, as was that of hundreds of others, at the local renal unit where new patients are trained and assessed. It takes time and courage to learn the intricacies of dialysis treatment, and it may be some weeks before this new patient has mastered the techniques and accepted that this may be part of her new way of life. The problems of running a renal unit are explained by the consultant physician, Dr. Oliver. Not only do we have to contend with the new patients coming into our program at the rate of up to 40 per million of population per year, but we now also have to provide dialysis facilities for those patients who have grafts which over the course of years fail and they don't die anymore. They return to dialysis to have second and even third grafts. Then there are another group of patients who have to wait for long periods for a graft or who are not suitable for grafting because of age or medical problems. Part of the training at this renal unit is to prepare patients to manage their own artificial kidney machine at home. Then we plug the dialysate line in for two minutes. Husbands and wives are encouraged to learn together. This is considered important, since they may have to live with the machine for the rest of their lives. For some people, this will be the treatment of choice. But for any patient on dialysis, the future may hold a number of problems. Our patients not only have to spend three evenings a week on artificial kidney treatment, and they must continue this every week of their lives, but, for example, they remain anemic, uh, they develop bone problems. In many cases, their skin becomes pigmented. They are infertile. Many of the men are impotent. Uh, there are problems that develop with nerves and with muscles, just to mention a few of the problems of our patients on artificial kidney treatment. In balance, the quality of life is so much better with a transplant that this is what our patients want. and as the physicians and surgeons providing their medical and surgical treatment. This is the treatment that we must give them. In this integrated renal unit, the program for each patient is worked out jointly between the physicians and the transplant team. Transplant surgeon, Professor Morris. Obviously, if we had lots of kidneys, we could indeed transplant everybody, and of course it would make it easier to give second and third transplants to patients who had rejected first transplants. And it would also enable us to be much more selective. This man was lucky. Five years ago, his first transplant worked. 
he's able to continue his work as a civil engineer and leads a totally independent and active life. In 1964, renal grafting was still considered experimental. But despite this, when renal failure threatened a 24-year-old girl, her first transplant was entirely successful and still holds. Apart from the freedom from dialysis, what does transplantation mean to patients? It's marvellous. It's a new way of life. Everything's different. Things you take for granted are things that really matter more now. You can see them, touch them. But beforehand, you were too old to realise that these things were around you. I think, basically, with the transplantation, it's the, the freedom from the machine. Because I'm studying history of art at university. It's very important for me to travel abroad. And I simply can't do it with the machines. Since I've had the transplant, life's just completely normal now. Since her transplant, this young housewife has given birth to a son and is now again pregnant. There have, of course, been many failures, but techniques are improving. In this example, a kidney from a relative is being used. But whether the kidney is from a relative or from a heart-beating cadaver, the principle is the same. The non-functioning kidneys may be left in situ. The implanted kidney is connected to the iliac vessels. The surgeon, Mr. Buick, explains the technique. That's the common iliac, external iliac vein. And we've tied the internal iliac vein so we can get this vein to come right up like that. And then that is the common iliac artery, the external iliac artery, and the internal iliac artery is down there. And some people would sew it onto the internal iliac artery by tying it off down there and bending it up this way. In this particular instance, I'm going to sew it on to the bifurcation of the common iliac into the internal external, I'm going to sew it on there. Right. Oh, we've just got to tie it down now, and this is where you can tear the vein if you don't relax everything and push the kidney right into the wound until you've got these knots tied down. Click, please. There's no doubt that the success rate with a kidney from somebody closely related in the family, brother, sister, mother, father, uh, give you the best results. Um, and this would be our number one choice from the recipient's point of view. Now, there are obviously ethical problems about uh, taking a kidney from somebody who is perfectly fit and well. Uh, and one has to balance these up between the success rate uh, and the welfare of the recipient. In practice, most kidneys must come from people who have died, and ideally from those who previously were receiving a high standard of care. It is known that there are enough people dying in hospital to be able to supply kidneys to everybody who needs one. Switching off a mechanical ventilator is a matter of concern to all medical staff, particularly those in intensive care. A distinction must be made between a persistent vegetative state and brain death. In 1976, the Royal College's criteria for establishing brain death were published, and they described the procedure in detail. The general concept is explained by neurosurgeon Professor Jeanette. Brain death is considered only in patients who are known to have uh, severe irreversible structural brain damage. That is, it's known to the clinician in charge of the case that they've had a severe head injury or a stroke or got a brain tumour, and that uh, all treatment uh, has been of no avail. It's then important to make sure that drugs are not contributing to the state or metabolic or endocrine factors or hypothermia. And only once one's satisfied that this is the case do we move in to do the formal criteria which are really to ensure that the patient is brain dead and that the ventilator can be switched off. The tests of brainstem reflexes uh, are gone through in order. There are no motor responses within the cranial nerve distribution, no facial grimacing elicited by stimulation of any of the somatic areas. The pupils are fixed in diameter. They don't respond to sharp changes in the intensity of light.
there's no corneal reflex. That is, no reflex when the cornea is touched. The vestibular ocular reflexes are absent. This is not to be confused with the ocular cephalic or doll's eye reflexes. The vestibular ocular is the movement of the eyes which normally occurs when ice cold water is irrigated into the ear. Uh, in a normal person, this produces nystagmus with a damaged brain stem, normally deviation of the eyes to one side. But if the brain stem is dead, there is no movement at all in either eye. This test is, of course, repeated in the other ear. There's no gag reflex or reflex response to bronchial stimulation when the suction catheter is passed down the trachea. Having done all these, one then has to confirm that there is no respiratory movement when the patient is disconnected from the mechanical ventilator for long enough for the PCO2 to rise above the threshold for stimulation of respiration. To make quite sure that there's no damage from hypoxia, oxygen at six liters a minute is continuously infused into the trachea, and it's known that this will maintain adequate oxygen levels uh, in all the vital organs for 10 or 15 minutes without any difficulty. The brain death criteria are means of determining that brain stem function has ceased. Now, brainstem function controls the breathing, which is why the patient is always on a ventilator, the movement of the eyes, uh, the pupils. But the heart does not depend on the brainstem. The heart can beat absolutely independently. So that's why uh, brain death seems such a curious thing, that the heart can go on beating when the brain is dead. For successful transplantation, it is important to maintain the kidneys in the best possible condition. Ideally, Tissue typing would have been carried out from blood samples taken for previous investigation. Advance warning of a potential donor can save valuable time. It must be established that there is no objection from the coroner or procurator fiscal where a coroner's case is concerned. Since the donor card scheme, relatives are more often prepared for this request. The removal of kidneys is ideally done as an elective theatre procedure with ventilation maintained to prevent the kidneys becoming anoxic. Once removed, they are perfused to assist cooling, thus keeping the warm ischemic time to the minimum. They will then be packed in ice ready for transport, which is coordinated through the UK Transplant Service. Uh, can you give us a uh, hello, yeah. this is the UK Transplant Service in Bristol. We've got a vehicle on the oh, train for us. Right, I've now got details. This service is in touch with all transplant units in the United Kingdom and has further links with Europe. Operating round the clock and every day of the year, it handles the tissue matching information from a likely donor and correlates this with the information on recipients held in its recipient files. This information is also fed into a computer so that it is possible to obtain an immediate list of the best matched patients awaiting a kidney graft, not only in the area where the kidney may be removed, but also in other areas, which may have an even better matched recipient. The delivery service is in the main carried out by courier vans, which are radio linked throughout their journey. Scheduled flights are also used to speed transit, both within the UK and abroad. delay is likely with routine flights, then they're able to call upon the St. John's Ambulance Air Wing, which arranges for volunteers in light aircraft to link up with the courier van service. Coordinating this whole transport operation is aimed at ensuring that the donor kidney can reach the best matched recipient in the shortest possible time, which is vital to increase the chances of a successful graft. Professor Morris. 
I think all of us in this field realize what a tremendous effort it is uh, in managing somebody who is going to be a potential donor and making sure that the diagnosis of brain death is complete and all that goes with providing a good donor of kidneys. But I think it's worth stressing that uh, when they wonder whether it's all worthwhile, that we're probably only providing treatment for a half or even less than a half of patients who could be treated by a renal transplant in the United Kingdom. And if you remember that the majority of these patients are between 25 and 50, all people who can contribute to the uh, welfare of the country, as well as, of course, on a more sentimental basis, being a wage earner or a mother of a family, then I think that this should, I would hope, stimulate people to do the work that's necessary to look for donor kidneys. Age need not be a barrier, but in a suitable donor, there must be no sepsis. No malignancy, except brain tumours which do not spread. No prolonged, severe hypertension and anuria, or any renal disease. But when in doubt about suitability or age, seek advice from your transplant unit. If we match uh, unrelated donors and recipients, then a patient who receives a well-matched kidney has about a 10 to 15% chance of a better survival than someone who receives a poorly matched kidney. But we can't really apply this knowledge unless we have plenty of kidneys. And in fact, with the present shortage of kidneys, we really quite often have to put poorly matched kidneys into patients because they're better with a poorly matched kidney than no kidney at all. But, and I stress the but, one of the major things to make matching work is to have really uh, a large source of kidneys. This cadaver kidney has just been connected and unclamped. Arterial blood is starting to turn the kidney pink. The recipient is a young man in his 20s. Following the operation, special care will be taken to reduce the risk of infection, since the immunosuppressive drugs essential for successful graft reception will lower his natural resistance. The most crucial time will be in the following three months. Already, five hours after the operation, he has passed 600 millilitres of urine. But what are the chances of success? It is important to remember that end-stage renal failure is a fatal disease. Considering the pooled European statistics showing the percentage survival rate over five years for dialysis and transplant patients, and considering the survival with other conditions, it is interesting to compare the prognosis. If these cancer figures are adjusted to include only those within a comparable age range, excluding cases treated palliatively, we can then compare patient survival with the chances of retaining a first cadaveric graft, remembering that further grafts are still possible as well as a return to dialysis. Should transplantation still be regarded as experimental surgery? We asked the views of a consultant in charge of an accident and emergency unit who has followed closely the developments of transplantation, Mr. Weston. I think 12 years ago, when I was first introduced to this subject, and when it was, it really was very early days, I felt very unhappy about this, the whole business of, of getting agreement and uh, kidney transplantation. But now I've been absolutely convinced that this is no longer an experimental uh, benefit other people's patients from those that uh, may have died under our, under our care. I think it does involve an additional amount of effort on the part of everybody at a time when we may have been working very hard, both nurses and doctors, and this is an additional labor which has to be undertaken. But I'm uh, absolutely convinced that this is something we should do, we need to do. Uh, this is just as much uh, a part of urgent treatment uh, as trying to uh, deal with somebody with a coronary thrombosis or a, 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 an acute injury. Yes, since the evolution of thermal brain death criteria, I think it would be agreed that it is good medical practice in intensive care units to recognize brain death once it occurs and once it's recognized to discontinue ventilation. And this is in the interests of uh, humanity and of the proper use of intensive care units and in that respect is independent of the needs or requirements of transplantation. If we do not transplant our patients, they have to be maintained either by hospital or home dialysis, both of which are expensive treatments. And so not only does transplantation provide the best quality of life for our patients, but when successful, it is the cheapest form of treatment that we can give them.
if somebody dies or is likely to die, it's got to be a reflex. Think of transplantation and contact the local unit. Thank you.